Were we not entertained by Gladiator 2? Yes, we weren't. Let's talk about it. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are back. That was Stone Podcast. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing Gladiator 2. It's going to be very interesting. But before we get into that, we are going to go straight to the movie recommendations for our 103 subscribers. We, by the way, oh no, we did we congratulate ourselves in the previous video? We shout them out. We shout them out. But we can always shout them out again. Okay, shout out to you, you guys. Always congratulate us, helps more. Yeah, we were saying. Thanks, guys, for having us reach the 100 mark. So if you're new to here, you know what I'm saying? We like giving you guys movie recommendations, and this is the segment for it. So, guys, what is the most recent thing which you watched that you really enjoyed? I mean, is a surprise that I'm recommending Arcane Season 2. We had a discussion about Arcane Season 1 a few weeks back. Uh, took Daniel some time to get into it, but eventually he sort of, he loved it. Uh, of course, it's one of my favourite sort of animated series uh, of all time. Season 2 does a sort of really good job of sort of building from where we started off, taking the characters into sort of kind of like new, interesting sort of directions. A little bit fast paced for me, how they kind of like go through the story. And I kind of wish it wasn't the final season. I wish that they were maybe fleshing out what they're doing across sort of an additional season. But nonetheless, it's kind of more of what, you know, you expect from Arcane, you know, brilliant animation, brilliant music, you know, brilliant storytelling, brilliant, you know, um, brilliant action throughout. It's, it's just... It's just good. It's it's just good. Like I literally found myself saying that a few times after like episodes ended that it's it's just good. So for anyone that doesn't know what Arcane is, it's a animated TV show based on the video game League of Legends. Follows primarily the story of sort of these two sisters, how they kind of like break apart and eventually kind of like try to find their, their way together and sort of kind of like all the trials and tribulations that come with it. And at the same time, there's this this whole like kind of sort of narrative between uh, this upper city and this under city, kind of like stuff that you've probably seen in, in other sort of movies as well. But the level of storytelling in Arcane is just second to none. It's sort of very, very well done, I would say. So that's my recommendation for this week. So when we talked about season one, you said season, the, the story would conclude in season two? Yeah. Well, there's three more episodes coming out on Saturday. Oh, okay. It's not all out yet. Okay, then, then ask me in three weeks. Oh. Yeah. So ask, ask, me again, ask me again next week when I recommend Arcane for the second time, for the second week in a row. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, I'm just like, my one of my things is that very few shows actually have good endings. Mm-hmm. And if they, it sounds like they have a very limited scope in mind for the story. Like there's two seasons and that's it. And any other spin off, start a new story and so on which I think it's how it should be in more in more shows. And I was just wondering if they actually managed to do that in this case. I, w- I would say my, my concern six episodes out of nine into the season is that we're kind of hurtling towards an ending as opposed to, you know, really fleshing out mm-hmm. some of the character changes, some of the character development that has been happening in the story so far, in season two so far. So that's that's my like my only gripe. You know, it's, it's not about the story that they're trying to tell, it's that the pacing of it is maybe a little bit too fast. But... Again, we'll see how it ends with you know, the last three episodes that come out this this weekend. Um, for me, I watched, by the way, I'm on episode three for um, Arcade. So far, it's actually all right and have the same reaction as the first season, but I'm just on episode three, so there's way more to go, so we'll see. Um, but um, I'm, so my recommendation for this week, well, my recent thing that I watched this week was is a film called Anora. Which, by the way, I was surprised that I actually liked this movie. So it's pretty much a, it's like a Cinderella story. But um, the Cinderella is a stripper slash sex worker. And she is from New York. I don't know where in New York she's from again, but she's from New York. And she ends up meeting a rich Russian kid. So I think his dad is like, a, I don't know who his dad or mom, but I think, um, yeah, so they, yeah, so they pretty much he comes from a rich family. And then once the news reaches the parents, because they didn't know that they end up getting married, which they end up getting married in like Las Vegas, um, the parents make their way to New York and they try and get their marriage annulled. But during the, that whole process, like during just in the story, it's just hilarious and it's just a great story, man. It's very explicit, but besides that, it's very, it's like it's an entertaining story. So obviously you see the Russian influences and you see the Armenian influences and it's just, it, it's, it's funny, man. It's, it's, it's not just obviously, it's... It, I was actually surprised it was like a co- comedy romance type of movie and those aren't really my go-tos but when I went to go and watch this one I was like whoa this is actually a very good movie it's a very good film um, I would definitely recommend that one the best thing I watched this week is Veep 
which is not exactly a new show, but it's a 2012 political satire about, it's essentially a comedy show about this politician who is trying to become president of the United States. And at the start of the first season, the vice president is kind of being completely sidelined by, by the rest of the administration. And the seven seasons essentially follow her attempts to finally become president and kind of maneuver Washington and like pol politics and the media and these all these trip wires that are being set up around her. It's not excellent all the way through, but the first five seasons or so are. It stumbles a little bit in season five. Season six is a complete dumpster fire. And, and seven then kind of pulls it up back again towards the finish line. But the first four, four to five seasons are what some of the funniest comedy I've seen in a while. It really deserves its reputation for being just this really funny political satire. It is quite raunchy in terms of its humor. And if you don't like like crass humor, then this is probably not for you. But it is, at least in the first couple of seasons, a very, very smart in, its, in, in the way it's, it uses that kind of humor. And they change showrunners after season four, and that's where the, the quality starts to slide. But but the first four seasons are, I, I would recommend, without reservations. It looks like it's time for the main event. Daniel, can you please let the people know what the hell Gladiator 2 is about? So Gladiator 2 is a historical action movie by Ridley Scott that follows the events of the first Gladiator movie from 2000, following the character Lucius, who is kind of a Roman in exile who gets who, who lives in this city in northern Africa where that gets conquered by the Romans at the start of the movie. He becomes enslaved, is made a gladiator, and he kind of get, then gets dragged into Roman politics at a time when Rome was at a low point in terms of corruption and decadence and so on. And then the plot kind of unfolds from there. So what did we think of Gladiator 2? Okay, so as a spectacle, as a movie, it was thoroughly entertaining. I will say that. All of the action sequences, all of the gladiator fights that were going on, uh, even like the, the boat fight that they had, it was all great. There was a lot of like strong performances in this, you know, Denzel. He's always top of it, whatever movie he's in. I even thought, sort of, you know, the main main character, sort of, you know, Lucius slash, I can't remember what his, his second name was, uh, was also you know, uh, really, really well acted in, uh, re really put in uh, a good performance uh, in this as well. My gripe, like whilst whilst I I enjoyed what the story was, and whilst I enjoyed you know, kind of you know this idea of like this sort of you know, prince sort of you know, going into exile and then coming back as a gladiator and this that, and the other and sort of you know, then you know having to kind of like re find his position sort of you know, in, in this Roman Empire essentially. Whilst I enjoy that story. I don't think the movie did enough character work with a lot of characters or, or gave enough for me to be fully emotionally invested in their story and you know, in the conclusions of a lot of the stories. I, I felt, you know, whilst watching it again, like I was thoroughly entertained, but like anytime there was like this like character payoff or there was like a payoff between sort of, you know, two characters sort of, you know, arcs, I just felt nothing really. And that was probably like the biggest sin of this movie for me. So in conclusion on my non-spoiler, it's a, it's a really good movie, just lacking enough character and enough heart to have me fully emotionally invested in sort of, you know, how things concluded, especially in the final act. Um, okay, so what I will say, Hervé, when you said it kind of did lack the emotional side of the film, like I do think it lacked the emotional of the original. Um, so it wasn't as emotionally engaging as in comparison to the original. But what I will say is I think this is, for me, was third or fourth, third or fourth best movie of the year for me. This felt like watching a blockbuster movie from back in the day. In terms of like, even when I went to the cinema, it was freaking packed out. I was, around. I was like, yo, just the feel of it. Even when the, even when it started, um, like showing the beginning credits, I was like, yo, like the way that that was done. And just, it just felt like a blockbuster movie and like I said for me I said it was third or fourth best movie of the year for me because purely for from its entertainment value um I do agree it did lack you know it lacked a lot of things which made 
the original masterpiece because I think you could kind of like feel like you can kind of be more emotionally engaged with the characters in the first movie because obviously of what the characters went through and it kind of delved in a bit more in terms of their character in terms of the way that they were whereas this one it felt like it was a bit rushed but for me I can kind of like look past that because I did feel like it was repurposed in the way of the first one but they just made this one a bit more of a sp- spectacle and more entertaining in terms of like the production in terms of like the fight scenes and just it just it was just entertainment guys like for me that's how i took it i was like yo this is actually a very entertaining film and the first one it wasn't like a classic for me i'll be honest with you i think i reacted to this like, long ago but when i first watched the first gladiator i've only seen it once maybe i have to watch it again but when i watched the first gladiator i said this is a great movie but it wasn't a classic for me so already going into gladiator 2 i wasn't really expecting much i wasn't expecting expecting it to blow my mind but when I watched this one I was like, oh, this movie was like it was amazing like just I was just engaged throughout even though it did lack you know the whole character development of characters and you know there was obviously stand-up performances I feel like for me the stand-up performance of course was Denzel just the way that he was plotting and scheming I think that was the few he felt like the snake in Adam and Eve so I think his character was done very well um and I, I liked Pedro Pascal's character I think he his character could have been great if they gave him more time. Um, I think kind of like Denzel's introduction pretty much cut him off like sooner than I would have liked. But in terms of performance, I think it was great and entertainment value was great. The fight scenes were great. Um, character motivations pretty much the same. I felt like like it was pretty much the same as before. But obviously before there was more depth. So I do understand that. But yeah, overall for me, the reason why it's third, fourth best movie of the year is because its entertainment value was. It felt like a blockbuster movie from back in the day. So what I think people get out of this movie depends a lot on what they care about. So I think this is the best Rome has ever looked on on film, I think. I think the most fully realized, like everything is big and grand and epic. And you believe that this is the place that runs the world, essentially, right? A massive amount of time and effort and resources and talent went into making this movie and that makes it just all the more surprising that they forgot to put a story in i had a really hard time really caring about lucius at all like just him as a person i think he's extremely unlikable he has no personality no character arc nothing he's kind of just there he's just a placeholder and the movie then could have built something around him that amounted to an interesting story especially when we are like in rome and we're dealing with emperors and senators and all these people who have all this all these resources and all 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 this influence and all this prestige and whatever They, they should be interesting people and the movie simply forgot to give them personalities and goals so in this movie characters change their motivation and their outlook and their beliefs from one scene to the next And in the last half hour, I basically went on strike. I basically said, look, if the movie doesn't, it's not going to get invested into these characters and I'm not going to either. And by the time, by the, by the last 10 minutes, the last showdown, I was counting the minutes until I could leave. And I slowly arrived at that point over the course of those two hours or however long the movie is. Like I really went into it saying, okay, look, I vaguely remember the first movie. I remember vaguely it being pretty great. Don't have, like I haven't watched it in like 20 years. I'm going into this fresh. I like Rome. I just finished listening to this podcast about Roman history. I'm therefore, a, you know, an epic about Rome in its in its at its worst, right? And the 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 characters and the fates and everything that kind of goes into that. And then the movie did not give me anything interesting, but at the same time, looking extremely pretty. So for that reason, uh, I found this movie very aggravating and very disappointing. And this is not the first movie where an amazing director just phones in his his like his work this year right like there have been others as well where for some reason they forget how to tell a story like they can make a movie like that, that on a technical level is wonderful and incredible but they kind of drop the ball when it comes to actually telling a story and i think that is why at least i go to the movies because i want to experience a story and i will go want to go on a journey with characters and if those characters aren't there then I don't care how pretty it is. Let's talk so about you, it. So do you get, because I think, then I feel like like your opinion is pretty much the same as the people who didn't like this film, right? Um, But I think yeah. the reason why you guys 
opinion of them not kind of like there not being a story there because I do agree like the character like the character arc for like they felt like there was no character arc for like, I even said it I wrote it down my notes I think the only person that had character arc was Denzel's character whereas the rest it kind of they kind of felt like fillers and they were just there to serve a purpose so I do agree with that but I do think also that a lot of because Gladiator is a film which is loved by many is seen as a classic so I do think a lot of fans were hot what the this, this standard that they set for this movie was pretty much a standard which has to match the original, like the brilliance of the original movie. So, and that's a more, majority of times that doesn't happen. Like majority of times sequels never match the brilliance of the originals. So do you think, right, especially, cause I don't know, Herbie, how you felt about the first movie, but for both of you, do you feel like the reason why you guys didn't fully enjoy this movie is because... You did. Re- you said, okay, cool. You said because obviously, you know, there was a lot of plot holes. There was a lot of like character development called cool, like, yeah. So you said that, but do you think it's because your standard was so high because of the first movie? The reason why you didn't enjoy this film? I don't think uh, so. I mean, so just, I just very. But if this was a standalone movie, are you still saying yeah. that you'd have the same opinion? I think so. Um, so first of all, it's a, it's a direct sequel that. It's directed by the same director 24 years later. And th- th- that movie includes flashbacks and ref- direct references to what happened in the first movie. So comparing it to the first movie is totally fair, I think. And also, if these movies are so similar and they are a direct con- continuation of each other and they're made by the same director and the sequel is worse in, worse in pretty much in every way except for the visuals, then I think that's a totally valid complaint. And I think if this was a standalone movie and there were no no names associated with it, I would still have the same complaints because I want to go on a journey with Lucius. I want to see what he does and why and what lessons he learns and what setbacks he... Like, all of these basic pieces that go into what makes a, a fictional character still need to be there, and those are completely neglected. Now, it may be that... They, th- this existed or- originally and this got butchered in editing because this feels a lot like they just started taking stuff out until the runtime was acceptable. I don't know if that's what happened, but that's how it feels. But any skilled storyteller, which presumably includes Ridley Scott, should have looked at this and said, no, this doesn't work. This, this, this like, like we need to do this again we, or we need to put in some pieces here so that this character's journey and not just Lucius, but every major character um, their journey makes sense. Like, motivations are not just changed, they're completely inverted. Lucius caring caring about Rome or not caring about Rome or caring about family and not caring about family or wanting or being willing, willing to die to respo- restore the Republic versus wanting nothing to do with Rome. Like, all of that changes from one scene to the next with no intermediate steps, more than once, for example. And there are also things introduced in the last 10 minutes, like this idea that Geta is mentally ill and like erratic and cannot be trusted with power that does not come up until the last 15 minutes like it's 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 essentially just declared at the end and then he and then he gets killed for being such a danger to rome but at that but up to that point he was just a guy right so like this movie simply does not know how to foreshadow anything how it doesn't how to set up anything how to seed ideas that can be harvested later. Like all of the very very basic, like it would be very arrogant to say that I can make a better movie than Ridley Scott, but this movie made me believe, right? Like I'm I'm deliberately exaggerating, right? But like, I don't understand how somebody who has made a movie before can look at this and say, yeah, this is okay. I think with Getter, they, they did imply that he was kind of the lesser of the twins in terms of like, Control in in terms of like decision making or like type of influence or whatever, he always seemed to be a little bit more irrational. It, it like to me, it seemed like there was like something off with him. But to kind of like answer uh, Jonathan's question, so I'd only seen the first movie very recently before watching this, so only, only like last week before watching sort of Gladiator Two. So I didn't have the same attachment to that first movie that people sort of know that have seen it and view it deem it as a classic had. And for me, the two movies aren't actually too dissimilar in terms of like what the story is and like and how things unfold. But I feel like where people fall in love more with the first movie was that 
one, Maximus is more of a captivating protagonist in, in his story. Uh, he has a lot more, a lot more gravitas and you know, people are behind him more in, in his story. And secondly, he has his direct foil in that first movie in you know, Commodus or Joaquin Phoenix char- uh, character Commodus in terms of like he was ultimately betrayed. He was trusted by you know, the Emperor of Rome to kind of like oversee the passing of power to the Senate. He was then betrayed by Commodus after again being entrusted by the previous emperor that died to foresee the power of like Rome being shifted to the Senate. And obviously, we also do see Commodus sort of you know, kill the emperor as well, someone that he was close to, and then eventually sort of you know, have Maximus be kind of like thrown to sort of you know, the gladiator, um, thrown to sort of you know, the gladiator pits essentially. So that immediately gives people enough emotional investment to kind of root for him to sort of you know, overcome the situation that he's in whilst also wanting to see the downfall of Commodus. Uh, and for me, in that first movie, a lot of things that are happening outside of that main story aren't really that interesting, doesn't really get fleshed out enough for me. And there, there isn't, like, there's this like, kind of, like, scheming of, of, like, wanting to kind of, like, wrestle the power away, but none of it's really that interesting in the first movie. But it's it's just, like, the main character, it's Maximus, who sort of really carries that first movie. And I feel like that's what's a little bit lacking in, this, in the second movie in terms of uh, Lucius's character. Again, he's, like like Daniel said, he's not he's not the most likable protagonist that, we, that we've seen on screen. And at the same time, he has this, like, rivalry or, like, this, like, kind of, sort of, no, hatred for the general Pedro Pascal's character. But we're not with him on that because we see Pedro we like we see Pedro Pascal's you know, character's motivation. I, I, I don't want to call him Pedro Pascal. What's his name again, Daniel? Acacius. Acacius. So we, we see Acacius's uh sort of you no know, his sort of you know, uneasiness with you know all this conquering that Rome's doing. So again we're sympathizing with him. At the same time he's also married to uh Lucius's mother. So all the while we're not wanting Lucius to go ahead and sort of and kill him and, and be against him. So there isn't really that. But isn't isn't there something there where they are both enemies and they mm-hmm. both, but they're both kind of patriots? Like, like Luci- like Acacius is a patriot, right? He he believes in the Republic. He wants it restored. He wants the bad emperors off the throne, and yeah. he's been doing his job as a good soldier. But he does not believe his efforts are doing any like like accomplishing anything, right? Or they could be accomplishing more, whatever, right? And yeah. then you've got. Uh, Lucius, who is some kind of royalty, right? He's he's, he's the son of uh, Lucilla, who is descended from one of the most revered emperors, right, of Rome. And so he's, he's some kind of no- nobility, right? But he's been in exile his entire life, and for some reason he hates Rome. I don't know if he just resents Rome in general for having been sent into exile, or specific people, or it's not it's not made clear why he feels what he feels about Rome. And it also changed, like I said, it, it changes in more, like more than once. Okay. Wouldn't it be cool if you put those two people in the same room and they have to work together for the good of Rome and they won't both want to do it for completely different reasons and they both view each other as the enemy? Wouldn't this that is, be a cool this, story? This is why I say a lot of the character payoffs in, in my initial review didn't work for me because you was I was like yearning for that moment, especially when they were in, in the gladiator pit fighting against each other. I was like yearning for that moment for them to realize that oh, like although he sees them as the enemy, they have a common goal in terms of sort of wanting to. Well, at the, at the time, you know, uh, Lucius didn't have that common goal. Lucius just wanted to kill him, but it could have been a case. But, but where, then in the end, both yeah. want to save Rome, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So. I was like again yearning for that moment for them to like realize that no they're probably on the same page and you know although you know what sort of you know, Acacius's actions sort of you know, Acacius's actions caused for your wife to be murdered and sort of you know, the home that you built to be sort of completely decimated it was something that was against his will and he was doing it just because he was kind of like told and again that then fits into Lucius's idea of like you know there needing to be a new Rome and having to like save Rome, save Rome and this and the other I, I, it just like yeah it, it just felt flat flat for me on, on on that part uh and it was it was like moments like that that were really frustrating in the movie where you just kind of could see the potential in what they were doing in the story and it just didn't go and, and again like again I know people want to tell the story I know directors and writers want to tell their story and of course you know we you know have to just kind of like consume it and you know whatever and we can't go in there with like our preconceived sort of you know um biases in there but as you're seeing things unfold you can kind of just like see the logical step of like how things really should have played out uh in in that scene but 
and, yeah. and I don't think I have that many preconceived notions, right? Like I now want to watch Gladiator again because I watched it mm -hmm. at a time when I didn't really know the history very much and not that Gladiator is all that historically accurate, but like, like I, I don't I don't think I fully appreciated what it was doing when I watched it because it was many years ago, right? So I wanna, it's now on my list of stuff to watch relatively soon. And I like Rome on gen in general, like just Roman history. I've got the box set of the HBO Rome series here somewhere. Here it is. If you want to watch something about Rome, watch this. I, I was generally, I, w I was walking in with no preconceived notions about where it should be. I did not have an opinion about the story. I had not really read any re reviews. And yeah. I was kind of, my like my enthusiasm was kind of unraveling in, in, over the course of two hours. Because I just kept giving the movie chances and it, it just shrugged and said, we don't care. That's that's my problem, right? Like, I think I, I think we agree that it has the potential for cool stuff, right? If you just take, like, the basic ideas of these characters and the setting and the circumstances in which they exist, you could tell all sorts of cool stories. My conceit is just that it, they didn't. Like, they, they did not bother to put something to put together something coherent. Like, I'm not even looking for Shakespeare or anything like that, right? Although, wouldn't hurt. But... Like just something coherent, something like like give Lucius like a coherent motivation for how he relates to Rome and war for who and what he wants to be and why he would want to fight for somebody like like for a country that discarded him when he was a child. Like even even if that is what happened, like I think that's even debatable, but he might perceive it that way, right? So so that that is just my 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 issue with the movie. And like the headline cost of this was like approaching 300 million. They got all sorts of rebates to push it more closer to 200. But that's an, a staggering amount of money and work and resources that goes into this. And every time they make a movie like this and just phone in the story, that upsets me genuinely. Like, like it's such a waste. It's a bit like, like a five-star chef who makes like a grilled cheese sandwich and burns it. And then tries to sell it to me for fifty dollars. You know what I mean? Like it does not fit. It's not. It's not what it should be. And I and I'm sure everybody involved could do better if they wanted to. And I I really wanna like get in a room with somebody like really Scott at some point and just ask, do you genuinely not care about story? Like do you think story is kind of whatever in movies? Like if you've spent you've made some of the most amazing movies ever made, you've do, been doing this for decades. Do you not understand or? Do you not, like, I'm sure he understands, but do you not care? Is, is, is this, like, exactly the movie he wanted to make? Or did, was he not able to do anything, anything better? Or am I, like, am I just going off on some, down some rabbit hole and this is actually fine? Like, I, like, I don't understand. Like, I don't, I don't know how, how this comes to be. So I'm going to start a Kickstarter for me to stalk Ridley Scott and have this conversation. <laughs> and I'm going to, and I'm going to. We're gonna have a follow-up video about this. No, but but seriously, like, surely he can do better. I didn't even know you guys had that much beef with the main character. I didn't even have an issue with Lucius. Um, I do agree. So, so what, what? What? Who is Lucius? What does he want, and why? He pretty much is. It's pretty much simple. So it's, it's simple. Like he, well, he's the son of Maximus, and he pretty much wants revenge for the killing of his wife. Um, and like I do, I agree that I think it, uh, like something interesting could have been done if. Pedro didn't that end up dying because I didn't agree with the way that he went out. I think they should have kind of like developed that, a story between where two enemies work together. Because I, but what I did enjoy about kind of like the build up to that was it's simple. The guy wants revenge for the killing of his wife, and the internal conflict is created and the stake is created because the guy that he wants revenge on is his mum's freaking husband, and his mum's husband didn't even want to kill. Like he didn't even know that he killed. Firstly, he wasn't even really so responsible for killing the wife. It was the two twins. Well, he, that's he, why let, thought, he let the army. Yeah, but that's not really the city. Oh, but that's not of his world. That's of the war of the emperors. So that's why I feel like it kind of like added more stakes because like you're going after the guy who technically like he didn't even want. I'm pretty sure he doesn't even want to be responsible. He doesn't even want to take over. Um, so I'm saying um, the country like the the place. It was the not his that idea, they but he did it. Yeah, he right? did it. So so but, I, I understand. So what I think what what could be interesting here is. If they have to make common cause for some reason, like like to depose the emperors or whatever, but they have this this blood between them that they cannot like that well Lucius cannot forgive Acacius. And that could be really cool drama. But that is not what happens in this movie. They do not team up in that way and they do not have this conflict in that, no, in but that that's... Like, the cause of pursuing that common goal. 
No, but that's what I was gonna say. Like it, that's that's what I'm saying. Like him, them killing um Pedro's character. I keep, keep forgetting his name, but them killing his character. It obviously doesn't allow for that to actually happen. So that's why I said it could have been a thing where um that's why for me I didn't have an issue with his character motivation because I was like, listen, it's it's a simple character motivation, pretty much. Yeah, and it is a sticky one because like I said, that's the um he's going after his mom's husband who didn't even really wanna like I said he like. He doesn't even. He's not even on the side of the emperors. Is that for me? Is the emperor that he should have been going after? But obviously, he's just going after the person who's. Yes, by default, he's responsible for his wife's murder. So that's what I thought was interesting, and but that's why I thought his character motivation was interesting, and it was simple, but it was interesting. I say it was simple because based on the originals, pretty much repurposed from that, but it was like watered down, and there was less. There was less depth to it. But I think it could have been even more depth added to his character motivation if he ended up working with Pedro's character. So that's why I do agree that you know. It did his story fall short by Pedro's character dying. However, before all of that, it was pretty strong. It was cool. Like it was like okay, I I, I can see the stake here. Like I I, so, I can see why that it kept me engaged. His story kept me engaged because I could see, like it, I can see the stake. Pretty much what I'm saying. So in one scene, he completely refuses to to fight. Essentially, enduring torture, essentially out of defiance. And then the next scene he's a willing gladiator and in one scene he completely rejects any any kind of association with rome and then in the next scene he want, he goes on this mission to save rome from the tyrants right so my problem is just there's there's a beginning and an end but everything in between is missing on on more than one occasion yeah but all of that is impacted by certain things that happen so he ends up wanting to fight for rome because but you don't see him go through that journey Right, you you do you it, it it skips the entire thing, without any kind of plausible explanation of why he makes that choice. Like there's no scene where he has some kind of realization or is put in a, into a situation where he has to choose between two things and he chooses Rome, for instance, right? And from from that point on, he devotes himself to to fixing Rome, right? Because that is what the final confrontation is about, right? Like him fighting Macrinus. Right, the Denzel Washington character that is just about preventing another bad guy from being on the throne, right, and trying to restore the Senate. That no longer has anything to do with personal revenge or anything like that. Mm. So, like, I, I, I'm just saying everything surrounding, like, this is supposed to have like pathos and personal drama and kind of the kind of the fate of empires is reflected in the decisions of individuals. Like, it's supposed to work on that kind of level. And that part just simply doesn't work at all. There's also other, like we, we focused a lot on Lucius, but there's also other stuff where they simply forget to tell the story. So for instance, it's commonly said that Rome is basically on the brink of collapse or is like in, in a bad shape. And basically it's barely functioning and the games are just an expensive distraction that will just that just makes the problem worse because it just wastes more money on kind of creating the illusion that Rome is healthy, right? But we do not see Roman dysfunction. We see a couple of beggars in the streets, like on, on two occasions. And that's it. There's nothing else. There's nothing else that suggests that Rome is dysfunctional. Probably like Rome has always had beggars on the streets, right? So if you take that aside as a symptom, there's nothing to indicate that Rome is not functioning. Like everything about this, any, everything about the emperors and about uh, the senators and about the Colosseum and the crowds, like the one thing that I think qualifies is that the guards have their bows pointed at, at the spectators, essentially waiting for somebody to step out of line, right? So that that's one sign that they rule by fear, which not sure that even makes sense because it like the point of the Colosseum is to kind of to entertain kind of the mob, right? So why why you want to openly intimidate them? Like that, not sure that makes sense, but okay. Throughout the movie had two hours to convey to us that something is broken at the heart of Rome. We don't even see the emperors do anything that crazy, right? We don't really, like, they're not good leaders, right? They're not, like, they're, they're clearly causing st stagnation in Rome, but you don't really see them be all that erratic, right? Not until the very end, but while they're ruling, like, uh, like you, there were a lot more opportunities to convey the idea that them being in charge is a disaster. Which it's supposed to, this is what it's supposed to be. Uh, and this movie tells us that that's what's happening, but they don't show it. So that, that's another example of, of that same principle that 
a movie should be communicating these things to us through little details set up over over the course of a movie to show us that like people like Acacius have lost faith in this in the system because this used to work for hundreds of years and now it doesn't and now it's produced people like Geta and Caracalla. I'm just talking about very basic modes of storytelling here that this movie just neglects to use. And as a result, the whole thing does not add up to an engaging story, in my opinion. I believe, I believe he tried to show that from like how sensitive um, the people were. Like for example, like the aftermath of whenever um, the emperors would make a decision, right? We all saw the riots. It's pretty much the sensitivity of um, the people of Rome. And obviously you saw in the aftermath of whenever the emperors would make a decision, you see the riots. And even within like the stadium, like they'll be easily riled up. Like, even, like, they'll be very vocal in terms of if they disagreed or something. I don't know if that was done in the first movie. So in the first movie, like, whenever emperors would make a decision, were they very vocal? Like, were they vocal with whenever they would disagree with something? Or was there, like, any, like, riots or anything going on against the emperors? In the gladiator pits were more to do with kind of, like, the fights that were going on and not, you know, people's, like, day-to-day lives. And so, again, like, the, the, the story's trying to make you believe that, you know, these people are all oppressed or, like, these people are going hungry because, you know, these emperors are, sort of, you know, kind of, like, power-hungry and are just kind of, like, chasing after sort of new lands to conquer again and again and again and, you know, at the expense of, sort of, you know, the people that are living in Rome. And I, I, I don't think, you know, the kind of, like, decisions or, like, sort of, you know, whether, you know, someone can, like, live or die in, like, the gladiator pits would you know, incite that or, like, what something to kind of, like, make people, you know, like, I, I don't think, like, the reactions to that, like, would indicate that they're, like, unhappy with some of the regime that they're, that they're living under. And if anything, it just showed that the people, like, were really behind Rome, even when, sort of, you know, even when, you know, uh, Acacius and his, like, his, sort of, you know, soldiers came back from, sort of, conquering uh, Lucius's, uh, Lucius's land, they were being, like, celebrated and cheered on the streets by, some sort of, the people of Rome. Like, they were, like, grateful for what they were going to do. And then on the flip side is that, you know, Lucius, when he was in the cages and this and the other, they were being antagonised by the people in on the streets of Rome and stuff like that. So, you know, the movie wasn't portraying enough. It, it wasn't portraying enough that these people were downtrodden on, the, these people that were, sort of, you know, being... Mass- massively oppressed by by the emperors. Well, no, but what I was, was going to say, that's a good point, but what I was going to say was um, their ver- like, the brink, of, for me, the way I translated brink of collapse was in terms of loss of control. That's what I was trying to say. So I was thinking, because I don't know how they, like, how the people were reacting in, obviously, you know, in the stadiums, how they were reacting to, obviously, the emperor's decision. But in this one, when I was seeing, like, the way that they were reacting and even the response to decisions and the aftermath, the riots, and so I'm like, okay, so I think He's trying to translate that the brink of collapse in Rome is just like pretty much they're losing control. And I think there was like a couple of scenes where Denzel was um like saying like I don't remember what scene it was, but he kind of like said something where he was like Rome is falling. This is all they know. And obviously, I think there was a scene where like if if you don't give the people what they want or something like that, you're gonna lose control or something. Where something happened in the stadium where he pretty much implied that they were losing control. So that's why I thought, oh okay, so Rome is on the brink of collapse because people are pretty much. They're, they're becoming less scared of the empire is how I translated that, you know, brink of collapse. So that's why I said to myself, oh, like for me, like they showed Rome, not not great. It wasn't portrayed greatly, but they did show Rome how it was on a brink of collapse because they were losing control. Like the people get more like, it's like, it felt like the people had more control than they did, than the emperors did. And it didn't feel like that in the first movie. So that's how I translated. Oh, OK, so mm. that's what they mean in terms of, you know, Rome is on the brink of collapse. I think some, somebody, I don't know if it's Macrinus or somebody else, who says something like, well, there's always riots and we always put them down. So we don't need to worry. Like, I know I don't remember exactly in what context that was said, but kind of essentially saying something like, well, like the mob can be managed, essentially. Uh, but I didn't get this feeling that this was about to spin out of control, right? Because I, I, I did not get the feeling that there was about to be a rebellion or an uprising or even riots, right? Like outside of the beggars, there seemed to be not much going on where the average Roman was not on board with what was happening. And like like the parade they get when they return from the conquest of Numidia, right? Like, I'm, I don't know, like, like the crowd seemed pretty healthy and pretty on board with everything. And 
like this whole, uh, like the system was working in the sense that the ruling class was delivering victories. And as long as that was happening, those people were, uh, were kind of on board with that, right? Uh, think, but they were under pressure to keep delivering victories. And I think that's actually a historical. I think at this point in the empire, they had stopped conquering. And that was part of the problem, that they had stopped delivering victories. I'm not entirely sure. But the system seemed to be working still at that point. But it doesn't just limit to the people. Sorry. I, I think I think the biggest sin that the movie made was when they killed uh, Acacius. Was, you know, they they put this general that everyone supposedly loves in the gladiator pit. And there isn't a reaction from the crowd as to mm, like what's he doing in there? Maybe like he shouldn't he shouldn't be in there, and you know he's being like classed as a traitor and this and the other. And then for uh, Lucius to so no, for him to like die at the hands of so, no, all all the arrows from so, no, obviously like the Romans so, and no, the soldiers that were uh, on the perimeter, and then for Lucius to just say, "Is this how you treat your general?" and then that caught that spark a mass riot. It just seemed like it was just. You know, again, it wasn't built up to. It wasn't like earned that moment. That and and that that's like a lot of things in this movie is like it just wasn't earned. The whole like flip of the crowd and like the riot and then like everyone feeling unsafe and like you know the emperor's needing to like suddenly leave and this any other in the movie. It just just wasn't. It just wasn't earned. And that was like at probably the point in the movie I was a bit like okay. Yeah, like you can you can argue how much detail you need to get for these things throughout the movie, but my, my thing is just the movie should be reinforcing these ideas throughout the movie so that when the payoff happens, there's no longer any explanation necessary. By the time Caracalla turns on Geta, we should know what their relationship is like, and we should know who they are as people, and we should know like what has been happening between them and why they take the actions they take. And I did not feel like I had a handle on that, or I felt I thought I did, and then the movie changed the rules in the last 20 minutes. And it kind of goes on like this for pretty much everything. I think that is where I w- would call it, like, like, like you use labels like bad writing or uh, broken character arcs or things like that. Because the, the movie's job is to explain to me and make me believe what, like that a certain reality exists, right? Like who these people are and what their relationships are and what choices they make and why. And I, I don't think this movie did, at least not anywhere near as much as it could have or should have. Like, that's kind of just my bottom line of it. And that is really important when we have a handful of people, right? We have Lucius, we have Acacius, we have Macrinus, and we have the two emperors. Those people are kind of making the big decisions that really make stuff happen in the story, right? And so we need to know who they are, and we need to know what they want and why, and what they consider legitimate methods and so on and why, and their outlook on things. And the movie instead spends a whole bunch of time on other characters that don't really do that right we like we've got uh ravi right the like the medic he, he's not completely superfluous but maybe if we'd spent like half as much time we would have had more time to kind of explore the relationship between geta and Caracalla, for example right so i just think the movie spends time on the wrong things and as a result it does not like by the time it's time to pay something off it's not done its homework i think firstly from i think the movie did give hints i don't think it gave as greater hints as the original movie but i do think it gave hints like for example i think the theme of control was something which was clear in this movie like control from when it comes to the like the control when it comes to um the people like i said they were losing control when it comes to the people um even within their own government um you know what i'm saying the emperor didn't even know that um pascal and his boys were ready to take over rome um even like between the whole two the point that you made between the two brothers i think with them, for me, why I I saw it turning out that way was because, like, you can tell that the brother, or, like, one of the brother was very crazy, and you can tell that the other brother had to kind of, like, keep him in check and keep, like, th- he had to have some sort of control over him to kind of, like, keep him cool and calm. And then when Denzel came in and controlled him through them, like, controlled him through his manipulation, that kind of, that in, in a way that it pretty much overshadowed the outcome there, because it was like, okay, if he doesn't stay in check... I, I can see someone being able to manipulate him to a point where his brother ends up losing control. And the way that he ended up losing control was by his by um his little brother getting controlled by Denzel, manipulating him to kill him. So I do think there were hints and I, I just I don't think it was it, it, it like I said, it wasn't in terms of the brilliance of the first one, it definitely wasn't the same. And it definitely there wasn't a lot of oh, like it, it definitely wasn't, you know, portrayed in the way like their journeys, their character journeys and character arcs were 
portrayed as good as the first one. I do agree. However, I do think the female control was definitely like the main gist of the film. And I do think it mm-hmm. was portrayed well enough for me in terms of what was going on. And just, you know, yeah, in the events that led up to the end. And I can't really argue the first, like the details of the first movie because it's been so long since I watched it. I did watch some refreshers just to remind myself of the plot. And I did have the impression that Maximus's motivations were much clearer. That Commodus like whole deal about kind of being groomed for this this job his entire life and then being told at the last minute that he's obsolete and that he'll never amount to anything in the eyes of his father. And that that informs how he relates to Maximus. Like it's, it seems like this stuff was very clear and very well, well fleshed out in the first movie. And that is the kind of thing that I'm looking for. That is the kind of thing that makes a compelling character that you then, where you then invested and in in their actions and in their fate, and kind of are on board when they make these big choices and and fight these big battles. Like I genuinely did not feel anything for Lucius when he had this showdown with uh, Macrinus at in the river. Like at that point, I was so checked out. I agree with that one actually. Uh, sorry, carry on. This should be like a scene like that should be the culmination of to, of of the entire plot, right? Like, like Lucius's journey should have led him from wherever he started, which might be like the prince in exile who doesn't care about his heritage, whatever. That's that's the Aquaman story, right? Like this is this is like this is a not not a very novel place for a character to start in, right? There's many stories that kind of have this basic template, right? But you take a character that starts like this and then ends up like on the battlefield trying to save a country that has rejected him or that he despises or that he was nothing to do with. Like in between should be a detailed journey where I can follow each step of the way so that I can understand why he goes from A to B. This entire scene with the two armies kind of watching these two guys fight. I did not know why Lucius was fighting that fight. I did not know why he cared, why he why he wanted to risk his life. And I also like whatever explanation the movie gave me, I stopped believing 20 minutes ago. Right? That's that's to me kind of really the bottom line. And I don't really care about the details. Like I enjoyed like the gladiator fights and then and the stage naval battle and everything. That, that's all great. I was even on board with the CGI Rhino and everything. But ultimately, what makes this movie memorable or not? Like I think the reason that the first movie will remain memorable and 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 has for 24 years and will continue to do so, and this one doesn't, is because the the main character and the journey they go on. And if that is broken, if that does not work, then everything else is becomes forgettable. I think. I th- I think that's the difference between a memorable movie and one that isn't. I see. I and I, I think each to their own. Um, for me personally, I just think. Um. I did say that the character arcs were lacking for other characters, and the one that was more of a highlight for me was Denzel. So I, I will like kind of agree with you on there, but I still think there was a character arc there, but it just wasn't strong, and it just it it, it was undercooked for me personally. Mm-hmm. But that kind of like was compensated by just the entertainment value for it, because it felt like. I kind of felt the same entertainment. Like I kind of felt as entertained as watching the Marvel movies back in the day. So it kind of had that vibe to it. Not the superhero vibe, but just like in terms of like, you know, the whole enjoyment of it. So I think for me, I, I, I'm compensating the lack of, you know, character building and how in depth you could have gone with their stories. I'm kind of compensating for that with the entertainment value. That's the reason why I'm kind of like seeing this movie in a better light than you guys are, because I still think there's a story there for each of them. But it's just not as great as the first one. However, the entertainment factor, which I enjoyed more of the entertainment here in comparison to the first movie. The story in the first movie is way better, I agree. But the entertainment, like in terms of the fight scenes and just the visuals, just like it just it's just way better for me. So I think the mixture of the two for me makes it such a great, like it, it is a great movie. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't I don't think I'm as as I mean, whilst I agree with like everything Daniel's saying, I don't think I was like I'm as strong as like I was like checked out <laughs> watching the movie. Cause like for me, like you you actually hit the nail on the head in terms of like like at the end of it, I kinda like compared it to just like some type of like Marvel movie where it's just like any blockbuster where it's like, okay, am I entertained like while going through the ride? Yes. Was the story serviceable enough for me? Yeah. It, like the story was serviceable enough for me to like 
enjoy it more than like this disliking the movie for me whilst like still being frustrated that there was like a lot of like things lacking and i feel like it could have gone in sort of different directions and you know could have been fleshed out a little bit more it's it just like my, my guy but you know I, I do agree with you like i it is for me a very very entertaining movie and what i, what I was going to say because jonathan you put this as like your third or fourth favorite movie of the year so i, I did want to talk about you know the positives that we had about the movie or things that we sort of kind of like did like about the movie so i don't know jonathan if you want to tell us why you feel like this is your third or fourth best movie of the year besides the whole entertainment side of it i think i think it's mainly to do with i don't want to sound like a fanboy but i think it's got to do with like denzel's performance I sound like such a fanboy, yeah. but like it's just the way that he was scheming. He just reminded me of um, um, Satan and Adam and Eve. Like he was just very mischievous, and it's like he, like you, you, he, the way that he was plotting was just. Well, he re- he reminded me of Littlefinger because he comes a... like Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Like he comes oh, yeah, from yeah, a yeah. fairly low, fairly low start, right? Uh, and he kind of kind of takes it like climbs the ladder one step at a time and he knows like who like how how to manipulate other people and he knows how to get uh advancement out of other people and in the end he gets close to being on top right yeah. and actually i did look up like some of the like this movie does not have to be historically accurate f- fully right first gladiator, gladiator also wasn't but i did actually look up macrinus and he's a fascinating character he's he's a Berber from North Africa, who was the first Roman emperor to never have been to Rome or not to not 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 govern from Rome, and he and he and he spent his life trying to fix the Roman economy, that that bought it basically another couple of generations until it finally collapsed under under its own weight two hundred years later. So this guy has like this guy came from nothing essentially, and then came to Rome as an outsider and worked his way up the entire hierarchy and ended up being emperor and broke tradition and convention in a bunch of different ways and still got a, a lot done and i think like from what like no, no, i'm not an expert in roman history or anything but he seems to have been one of the more effective emperors like some of them like did nothing some of them did a lot of damage and this guy at least tried to do something positive apparently and he did it as somebody who was not exactly born into like he did not come from a family of senators or anything like that right so I want to see a movie about that story, oh, yeah. right? Like, mm. and also Geta and and Caracalla, more interesting in history. Like they were co-emperors and they kind of shared power on paper, but they hated each other so much that they had kind of a cold civil war going on. And they kind of never were, like they governed essentially separate parts of the empire and their entire retinues and households were built around them never being in the same place at the same time because if they did there might be civil war because they hated each other so much mm-hmm. i want to see that movie too so i'm not saying it does it has to be historically accurate it's not bad because like because it departs from the historical figures but i'm just reading these biographies and i'm saying what well, why is this better than what we got what you're saying, Daniel, I actually do agree. I think I agree with, because Harvey kind of like said it perfectly. It was like, it was serviceable. So I agree. It was serviceable for me. However, Daniel, you like, in terms of what you just said, I do agree. Like this, the, it could have made the film from serviceable to, who knows, a borderline classic if they did what you just said. Because in terms, especially with the two brothers, if it got to the point where they actually showed us, like their relationship could have built, instead of killing, yeah, instead of the brother actually killing the other brother, it could have led into a part where, they get to the stage where they hate each other and then they could have gone, you know, it could have related to the, um, to the actual backstory of, you know, the actual, you know, figures back in the day. So it, they, a lot could have done with the story. So I'm not agreeing. I'm not trying to say this movie, the story was great. No, no, no. I'm just saying it was a mixture of how entertaining it was with a service of the story. That's for me, it made it great. But um, yeah, but and, in terms and of I like, think a lot depends on like what you care. And I just care about character and story more than anything. And like I can I can I can see how you can like like a lot in this movie, right? Like this might be the most lavish spectacle about like Colosseum fights ever put to film. And if that's what you're there for, then you're gonna have a great time with this. It just like the, I don't think these two things contradict each other. Like you it's not like you have to choose between them. So 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 basically I can just report my my reaction to it, right? And my reaction was the movie is doing everything in its power to make me not care about these people. And that diminishes my enjoyment of the movie. 
while at the same time, a lot of effort goes into other stuff that I think is less important, right? So that's kind of my, my bottom line with this movie. Just, I was just going back to kind of like Denzel's character. Yeah. I was more engaged with his character to see how he was going to rise to power more than anything else. So that's why for me, I really like this movie. Um, yeah, Lucius Glass, Lucius character was cool. I feel like I think his character motivation was simple. It wasn't standout ish, but it was simple. So I think everyone else is like everyone else's um, character motivation is movie. But how much character? I think there was only Lucius, there was Denzel's, and then there was Pascal and the mother. So it was kind of like four. So it wasn't that much. Also Lucilla, who did who did not do very much. And then she died in like the most like famous way possible. Uh, <laughs> and had that actually struck before. me as something the Romans would have done. I think I, I tied him up in the gladi. Yeah, prob- probably. But in, in terms of like the emotional impact in the story, sure. uh, again, like with like Lucius is like flip flopping as to like you know one minute she like completely hates her and then the next minute he's like all about family and this and the other. It's just like it just kind of like fell flat for me. But Pedro's character, like once they like obviously showed him to be like conquering sort of you know uh, you know where Lucius was living uh, initially, and then he came back and he was having that internal conflict about sort of you know you know, um, about, like, hearing the mothers, like, weep about, like, their children, you know, uh, and having, like, second second guessing, like, expanding the Roman Empire and stuff like that. I was like, okay, this is, like, there was, like, a really, like, cool, interesting, like, character development there. And I was, like, just, just a little bit frustrated that his one was, like, cut short. And, you know, it amounted to just him expressing how much he loved his mother to Lucius, who was shown to at that point not really care too much about his mother so it was, it was just like frustrating kids one that one that one got me the most because there was like so much potential in terms of like your top general being against what he's being instructed to do but at the same time having the weight of like the empress and like sort of you know, the power of the empress to like keep pushing him to do stuff that he didn't want to do so it was just like yeah so it seems like <laughs> it's okay it seems like the story had so much potential it seems like in terms of the entertainment side it, was, it had everything like the fight scenes and all of that that was great but in terms of the story it just seems like had potential to be a very great story. So do you think he was being lazy, the director? That's kind of, but that was the point of my rant earlier about I want to corner him like in an elevator or something and ask him, right? <laughs> it's, I cannot believe that he just doesn't care or doesn't think story is important. Like this is not just me ganging up on Ridley Scott, right? This is like seemingly everybody, right? Like, like it's like, this is not like, the only one, right? It's it's a common thing that we've said about so many movies this year where like the premise or the idea behind it is great or like sort of you no know, elements of it are good, but somewhere along the lines something goes wrong or something like is missing and then we just end up with something that feels half baked or feels underdeveloped. And I don't know whether it's you know how movies are being written today or whether sort of you no know, they're bringing in the wrong writers or whether the directors don't have the right control or whether it's like studios meddling i don't know what it is but it, it just seems like there's always something that's causing these movies to fall short of what they potentially could be and it's not just like millennials who live on twitter or something like that right like whatever ex- pet explanation you want to come up with about how like i don't know the new generation doesn't know how to tell stories or whatever like this is Ridley, like Ridley Scott has been doing since this for decades, right? And Martin Scorsese, same way with Megalopolis or whatever it was. It's uh, like, like these are the same people who have made some of the best movies ever made. And something is up when consistently people who should do this in their sleep or should at least create something functional that works on every level just in their sleep without even trying turn in something like this. I think that is right. If this was some other movie, I don't think I would be has been out of shape about it. It's just, I think something is very wrong when somebody who's one of the best in that field just can't do it or doesn't think to do it or something. Like, you know what yeah, I mean? Like, like that's, that's the thing that I cannot get over. This is the same person that did Aliens, two of the greatest movies of all time. Doesn't make sense. And I don't know if he's, like, I don't know that anybody's telling Ridley Scott no. That's the thing. Like, I don't know that... He would do better, but for some reason the studio is hamstringing him or something. It cannot be that. I don't know. As somebody who just cares about story primarily, right? I go to the movies for stories. And so when some of the best people in the field cannot put together a good story, like if you have $300 million to play with, you cannot claim that you tried, right? Like nothing short of excellence should be the benchmark when when you are operating on that scale, right? With that amount of experience and that, that amount of resources and everything. It's just strange. Like I'm not even angry about it. Like I'm not I'm not doing the fanboy the rage thing. I'm I'm just 
a little bit concerned and a little bit puzzled why this happens. But also the audience doesn't seem to notice. Like like this is getting a lot of positive reviews. And I was like on Reddit, on the bo on the box office subreddit, and was looking through reviews and I had to scroll really far down for somebody to like point out the issues with the story and everybody else says, yo, it's just good fun. It's like a spectacle. It's a thrill ride. I, w I was going to actually ask, do you actually think that we're the problem in, in terms of, you know, so, so many of these movies that we've discussed have, actually, I, actually I, won't, I won't say so many of these because there have been some like flops across the year, but like there's there's been a few unexplainable some of the movies where the story hasn't been great, but they've received really positive audience reviews. And is it is it a case where there was a, there's like been a period where some of the story hasn't been the forefront of some of what people have been looking for when going to the movies so that, you know, so that when they're actually creating these movies, the primary thing isn't to tell a good story. The primary thing is to entertain in a different way. And, you you know, these things kind of go in cycle and it, it feels like, you know, that's what was kind of maybe rewarded for a set period of time, especially kind of like in the Marvel era where, you know, a lot of the stories weren't super deep or super like sort of intricate or whatever. Uh, they were still kind of like good serviceable stories. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of good movies in there as well. But it, it just seems like the audience are reacting differently in terms of sort of know what they enjoy on the screen and i feel like the studios have been trying to cater to that whilst neglecting telling a good story and i feel like we might get to a point where it kind of like comes to a head and they need to kind of like change course and like sort of start to kind of like change what they prioritize when sort of choosing what how to sort of best entertain the audience I think this is a very complicated topic and trying to understand why a movie does or doesn't work or is or isn't financially successful is very difficult and it's the kind of thing you can project your biases into and you can, like a movie can do everything right and still flop and a movie can be deeply broken and still just hit a nerve and make, make all the money. Like Madam I think we were, we were pretty, pretty unanimous that Venom 3 is not a, not, not a good story, right? That, it, it's not a good conclusion to the story of Eddie Brock and Venom. We spent an hour talking about that. But the movie made a whole bunch of money. So that movie is currently at $436 million. And it seems to be widely liked. Hey, right? So this movie is not being rejected by audiences, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I just thought there wasn't a whole lot there. Like it wasn't it wasn't all that, like the, the action wasn't all that great. The characters weren't all that great. So movies routinely make a lot of money, even though they don't really work on a character level, story level and so on. But I do maintain that the things that really are successful and that define the industry and the genres they're in, like any really big success that comes out of nowhere and just gets success on its own merit. So it doesn't coast on, on an IP or brand or nostalgia or something, but that actually resonates with people and gets big, fundamentally rests on a good character. I really, I really do believe it. I didn't see Inside Out 2, but everything I've heard about Inside Out 2 said, tells me that it like that it really gets to people on an emotional level, right? Because it it really tells the story about this one person and her emotional journey and stuff like that, right? And it's not just like bright bright colors and wacky jokes. I don't think anything really becomes really big just by being entertaining in that sense. I think movies like this can work either just they burn out quickly because it's something for people to watch, or it kind of rides a nostalgia train, but that that nostalgia was earned by characters in the first place. I really do believe that. Like that's kind of why it's one of my litmus tests for what a really good movie is, because like that's like that what catapults you to the upper level. If you have those kinds of characters that people really care about, like Lord of the Rings is nothing without Frodo. Um, the MCU is nothing without Tommy, Tony Stark. Um, Hunger Games is nothing without Cadmus. Alien is nothing without Ellen Ripley. The list yeah. goes on, right? Like every big story that that people care about rests on characters, at least one. That's why I agree with you. And what I was saying is that it feels like we're in an era where people have seen the success of, sort of you know, those movies that you've listed there, but they don't understand the essence as to why they were successful and are just doing things that they feel audience will react to well. Uh, yeah. and, it, and in some cases, the audience do react to it well in terms of sort of you know, like you know the venom movies I've, I've never understood how the venom movies have made you know the amount of money that they've made but for whatever reason people you know continuously go out to see the venom movies and if, if it feels like you know like like i 100 agree with you like you're not going to build a brand new franchise 
off of sort of telling a bad story of you know of a character that no one can sort of completely like resonate with and this and the other you you need that foundation you need that story and that sort of character to build that foundation to kind of like build uh that emotional connection to you know with that character but it, it just seems like what we're getting at the moment is a lot of movies that are again built on sort of what's come before that's why we're getting so many sort of like IPs being dug up like even this movie Gla- Gladiator 2 is an IP from you know 24 years ago that they've like dug up and sort of made a second movie about um just because of sort of people's emotional connection with the first one they've like turned it into a spectacle without kind of having the same respect of the story and you know the same respect to sort of the character of Maximus which made him sort of so popular initially which is which is what I'm saying I, I feel like eventually we'll, we'll leave this era where you know we're so kind of like focused on or like they're so focused on just like providing the wrong kind of entertainment and hopefully we go back to sort of know that story and that character being the forefront of sort of know what these studios are trying to sort of know put out and you know what's actually being rewarded and it's not like hollywood has ever been flawless about this right like the yeah. like most movies in all eras have been not that great but there's been like the steady trickle of like somebody has a good idea and it's done well and it finds an audience and that's a big success and that then joins the pantheon of pop of of pop culture and of movie movie culture. Yeah, I, th- I think there's been a shortage of that, like in the past 10 years or so. Like I think the 2010s still had a few, but that kind of fizzled out towards the end and we're now halfway into the 20s. And it feels like this stuff is getting less and less. If anything, it's like, more TV series. If, if anything, that's kind of maybe. like transition to TV series as opposed to movies. You know, you're, you're getting like these like really big shows that really take off and like, you know, get these like really big following and stuff. And it's, it's happening less and less in movies, it seems. Maybe, but they still have all the resources they could ever want, right? So yeah. it's it's a bit puzzling for why they don't seem to try, especially since like there's now this push for more theatrical releases again, right? After trying to make streaming work for a decade. And so that that, that ultimately means there's still money there and and there being, a, there being money there means there's an audience there, right? And when something does work, it does make all the money, right? Like we've had successes this year, like Deadpool and Inside Out and other things that just go past 1 billion, 1.5 billions or more, just because they really hit a nerve and they found their audience. And when you do that, they seem to, like there's still there's still the money there. So it's not like but nobody's you, watching movies anymore. No, but no, you, you, yeah, you can you can argue like Deadpool hasn't got the greatest story or sort of kind of like character development. But people like the character, like they like, they, they, like, they, the like those movies deliver what they're supposed to deliver, and they're very focused on the character. Yeah, that I mean, Deadpool questionable in, in, in terms of like the story wise of it, like it's, no, but but like that's just a thing of like people just showed up again to the theater once they were being offered something they wanted. This is my thing, yeah. right? Like, and whenever some, like a movie does that, it's you still get these billion dollar successes, right? That you just don't get in TV. Yeah. yeah. So, last question. Was Gladiator 2 needed? Should they have just left it off at Gladiator? So I, I, I still think there's the potential here for cool stories. They just didn't put it into a shape that I found satisfying. I don't think any movie is needed. The question is, like, does what does it offer something? And I think this movie does offer a few things, but it's it, it leaves so much potential on the table, and doesn't replace it with something that is equally good. That I just I just walked away frustrated. That and that like and that as a result, I had a negative experience watching this movie. But I think this absolutely could like you could tell like this is, you, could, you could tell another story about a gladiator in another era of the Roman Empire and who was just in in different circumstances than the one from the first movie but there's enough of a connection there that it's that it's a sequel or what like, nothing about this is broken from the start i think so i don't think there was any any uphill battle for this movie as far at least as far as far as i was concerned like like all my frustrations with the movie came as i was watching it I didn't bring any of that into the movie like at the start and you can see like the fact that people showed up for this movie means that there there was that clamor for it there was that like sort of want to kind of like revisit this world so in in terms of like them you know wanting to make more like i don't think people are against it uh and i mean mean, people enjoy enjoy the first one they probably will turn up for uh, another movie if they do make it it's just like you you just have to be for for okay for people like myself and daniel you just have to like deliver a little bit better on the story and the characters in it but 
in in terms of like doing more in this world i'm like i'm all for it like i i like i want to delve more into some of the roman history it's like a period of time which seems to have like a lot of like fascinating characters and a lot of, sort of fascinating yeah. stories that are going on so it's just like you know there's through... a reason why people have been fascinated with it for yeah. centuries yeah so just doing more of that all right well unless anyone got anything else to say i think it might be time for the last thoughts I mean, with with everything said, my score is probably gonna be a little surprise. But I was, like, I, like for the cinema experience, I enjoyed it so much. I I enjoyed this movie so uh, a lot. Came out of it with some some gripes uh, about the story and character. But again, for me, it it did enough to make me enjoy it. Probably not one that I would revisit though. Which makes me re- reevaluate my score. It's, it's not one that I'm like rushing to revisit uh, at all. So, with that saying, I will give it a I'll give it a seven out of ten. For me, I think I enjoy this a lot. Besides, of course, I mentioned entertainment value a lot, but I think the reason why I enjoyed this a lot was because I treat it like a standalone film. You know, even though obviously this is a sequel, like the first one came out so long ago, so. It is I wasn't kind of like comparing it to and like I wasn't ex- and even the first one even though the first one came out a long, time, like a long time ago it wasn't like a classic for me it was a great movie but it wasn't a classic for me so with that in mind and also that it was you know I treat this like a kind of like a standalone film it you know it was definitely I had a great experience with this one man it was it was fun it was fun and I I, I wasn't expecting it to have like a even though I wouldn't have been mad at it but I wasn't expecting like you know you know Maximus's um death to have any impact on the sequel even though they probably should have but i don't think um for me i didn't i wasn't expecting that because like i wasn't expecting nothing and i think a lot of people that enjoyed this movie i think that that's a lot of the i think the reason why they enjoyed it so much was because they treated it like a standalone film but yeah man so i think all in all it was a it, it was a great movie for me before i said 8.5 However, after today's discussion, you know, I'm seeing it in a different light. The light is, is still, for me, going to be fourth. I'll probably say fourth greatest film instead of first. I'll say fourth greatest film, and I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10 instead of an 8.5. Because before I give it 8.5, but I'm going to give it an 8 it's out of 10. another three hours, and we can put that down to a 7. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that is, that's funny. But this would be a film that I would watch again, though. Yeah, so um, I think there's a lot of details in this to like. The spectacle, the sceneries, the individual characters and moments are, ju- are fine. It's not like it's a train wreck or anything. It just, it's got a hollow core. And I think movies like this, I think, rest on that foundation. And if that foundation is missing, then you've got a problem. And that is exactly why I had a frustrating experience with this movie and did not walk out having enjoyed myself. So for that reason, it's a five out of nine for me. And that's kind of the bottom line for me. Well, today has been interesting. Guys. I don't know. When was the last time we actually had a debate? Because today was a debate, I feel like. But it's guys. Well, anyways, guys. We've we disagreed we... about movies, right? Like, but Yeah, but I think we've, I think our past films, we've kind of like been, we've like we've agreed with each other for our past movies. So mm. I think this one is refreshing that we're actually bumping heads, man. But um, well, yeah, guys, hopefully you enjoyed today's debate. Are they? Yeah, let us know uh, your thoughts down below. Where do you sit with Gladiator 2? Do you love it? Did you see some flaws in the stories like we did? Let us know down below in the comment section. And of course, if you enjoyed the video, tell a friend. And if you hated the video, tell an enemy. And and donate to my stalking uh, Ridley Scott Kickstarter. Link in the yes. comments. We will get um, answers. We will get answers. One way or the other. All right, guys, you heard it here first. Uh, we will catch you next week. Au revoir. Ciao. Bye-bye.